Good evening. Welcome to the Town of Weathersfield Inland Wetlands and Conservation Committee. This is a public meeting. It is Wednesday, March 16th, uh, 2022 at 730. Uh, this is a virtual meeting in accordance with the governor's executive order. Uh, at this time, uh, we'll take public comments. Seeing none, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which will be a uh, public meeting, which we have none on the agenda, and there is no uh, Conservation Commission business, so we will go right into general business. And today we have uh, the Town of Turney, who is meeting with us to discuss some of our responsibilities and roles as a commission. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You want me to uh, start off? Yes, please. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I am happy to be here. And, and again, I mentioned it before you started the meeting. I, I thank you for, for rescheduling when I was under the weather when I was supposed to make a presentation to you before. Uh, just by way of a little background, um, a lot of the work, that, a good portion of the work that I do, um, not only for the town of Weathersfield, but um, for a, a bunch of other towns, um, has over the years involved uh, wetlands work, um, and I both you know, have also represented uh, private property owners in ap seeking applications for permits. But I, I've had cases um, in both the Superior Court and actually had several go as far as the Supreme Court involving uh, the Wetlands Act and have done some training for it. Was involved in training with with the, um, actually when it was DEP uh, and worked on on some training for that and have presented. Uh, a training session for other wetland agencies that, that for other towns that we represent. Uh, now, I have a slideshow that as long as the technology works and I can share it in a second, uh, I'll go through that and I'll, I'll just uh, tell you that basically is broken in, in half. The first half being a summary of, um, and for folks that are only on by the phone, I, you know, I will be summarizing, you know, the, and speaking about all the slides. It's certainly not a slideshow intended to uh, to be, be reviewed, so you should get you know the benefit of the presentation, even if you can't see the can't see the slideshow. Uh, but the first half of it deals with you know some of the basics of not all basics, even some of the you know some of the case law and, and slightly more complex uh, aspects of inland wetland regulations and in your powers uh, in in regulating them. Uh, my second portion would deal with the holding meetings and hearings and some of the do's and don'ts of doing that and things like uh, recusals, recusals and conflicts of interest and, and the like. So with that, I'll kick off hoping the, uh, I can get the screen to share appropriately. And uh, all right, and can you see that uh, slide that just has the title on it? Good to go. Okay, excellent. So, all right, I'm going to, before I shared, I was able to uh, manipulate the slides. I'm going to stop sharing for one second. Once it's in, uh, in this software, it's going to need me to have it operating a slightly different way. So bear with me one second. All right, I'll try again. Can you see that again? Good to go? Okay, excellent. So there we go. So the, the Wetlands Act is starts at, at section 22A36 of the general statutes, which is part, title 22A is part of, uh, is the environmental protection title of general statutes. So all the formation of DEEP, all of the various environmental regulations uh, that DEEP implements are in that title. And the wetlands regulation is unique in Connecticut. Every town exists through power that's given by state law. And the town has, is given the power to adopt zoning and has the power to adopt subdivision regulations if it wishes to, uh, but it doesn't have to. And there, is still, there are a couple holdout towns that haven't adopted zoning. Uh, 
wetlands is a different story. Uh, wetlands are an important resource recognized under the uh, under Title 22A, and every municipality in the state of Connecticut has to have an agency that serves as a wetland agency. Doesn't have to be an independent agency. There are some instances, it's it's very much the exception of the rule, uh, but there are some instances in which that uh, a combined commission, a, a planning and zoning commission serves also as a wetland agency. So the statute requires that there be an agency. It doesn't, have, it doesn't say what you call it, but it has to happen. Um, and the DEEP does retain some jurisdiction in the event that, and I've not, uh, I'm not aware of it ever happening. I, I've heard people threaten that a, a wetland agency is, you know, not not doing it, not doing its thing, and they're going to, you know, blow the whistle on deep. Uh, but theoretically, if a deep, if deep is not, um, you know, it sees that an agency is really derelict in its responsibilities, it can take over local regulations. Uh, and there are also some authority uh, for someone if an application is sitting and the commission is not acting on it. And we'll get to you know statutory guidelines for when you act. Uh, they they can seek a permit from deep. Although if anybody's done, and I, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not being disparaging. They have a you know a, a, a lot of business to do, and they're short staffed. But uh, getting a permit from deep is probably not going to come quicker than a permit from a local agency, even if it's working more slowly than the statute would recommend. Um, and so the preamble of the statute, just to recognize how important the wetlands are, um, yeah, and I'll, I'll just read that quickly for the benefit of folks that are listening, but the inland wetlands and watercourses of the state are an important natural resource which should be preserved in order to preserve an adequate supply of surface and underground water, recharge, and purify groundwater, control flooding and erosion, protect wildlife, fish, and vegetation. Uh, that general purpose uh, is, often cited in cases that, that come up from, from uh, decisions made by commissions. Uh, and you, I'll, as I'll talk about in a minute, there's a balancing that's provided in the act that does recognize you know, there's a need for economic development and, and reasonable uh, use of, of one's land on the one hand, but there also has to be a protection of uh, consideration and protection of environment and of ecology. So, uh, you know, your rulings, you know, they, they are wetlands agencies' decisions. Uh, like other land use decisions, a court is not supposed to interfere uh, with your decision making on, on the facts. Uh, now, if you make a mistake in interpreting the law, that's different. Courts are supposed to, you know, that's, that's essentially their job if they review what you do. Uh, but evaluating the, you know, applying your regulations to a particular application it's really in your discretion. I'll talk a little bit about when you get expert testimony that can sometimes limit your, your discretion, uh, but as a general matter, you have the ability to, um, you know, your decisions are usually given deference uh, by a court. Now, one you know, misconception, although commissions do a pretty good job of avoiding it, I mean, the Wetland Act doesn't prohibit activity in the wetlands. It doesn't prohibit filling the wetlands or eliminating the wetlands. Uh, it requires that your agency consider an act activity that will cause those kinds of impacts. And, you know, there's a balancing act of whether or not you're going to allow that and a whole variety of factors you might take into consideration uh, if you were going to allow an activity that, that's regulated and directly within a wetland. Um, and, uh, but it is, it, it is, you know, something that when you are seeing an activity that's not exempted uh, from regulation, but is subject to your issuing a permit, and there's going to be an act, actual impact on the wetlands, your, your discretion would likely not uh, be disturbed. If you're doing that to regulate activity that's outside of the wetlands, which you have some discretion to do, uh, but if you do that without some tie to an impact to a wetland, uh, then you you know runs some some risk of challenge because you know buffer areas or areas around a wetland themselves are not the regulated resource it's the wetlands and certain activities in proximity could cause impacts on the wetlands and that you have authority to try to avoid but the the, the regulated area outside of the wetlands is really intended to be a pipeline and I'll touch on that in a minute. So there's, there's five functions that you have. The first is you have to amend them, adopt your regulations and you can amend them. Now, most all towns came from the, the, 
DEEP's um, model regulations. So there really isn't a lot of difference from time to time, but it's kind of uh, you have the ability to determine the boundaries and amend maps. Now, as you probably know, uh, unless you're very new to the commission, you know, the, the, the real way to determine what, the way to determine if something's a wetland is based on soil types. Federal wetland regulation has, uh, has three factors that you look at, which includes vegetation. There, there, there are three different things that they look at. In Connecticut's act, it's, it's strictly based on the soil. Uh, and, but, you know, when the act was adopted, no one had gone around and done, I mean, water courses are one thing. I mean, you, people know where rivers are, people know where lakes are, those could be shown on your map. But the wetlands based on wetland soils were, were not fully determined. They could be estimated. So there were maps, towns adopted a maps based on what the, the estimate, it was a very educated estimate, but it wasn't actually flagged in the field everywhere. So you have a map, and then periodically someone might wish to have you um, evaluate or, or make a modification in the wetlands map and present information that based on a soil scientist report that, that the, the actual boundaries of the wetlands are different than what's shown on the map. Uh, and, and sometimes in practice, you effectively change the boundaries because when anybody does under what I have under item three on this PowerPoint, you pass on permits for regulated activities. And when somebody files a permit application, one of the things they have to do is identify and survey the location, the boundary lines of the wetlands. So those boundaries will then be affirmatively determined in the context of your, uh, of your review of the application. And that would become the, the guiding line. Um, and commissions you know, often don't go through it every time they've, they've made a change or a permit where they specifically delineated it, they go and change the, uh, the map. That's uncommon, uh, but you certainly can do that. Uh, you can enforce the local zoning regulations uh, and have an enforcement officer that would be delegated to be able to do that. And I will touch on enforcement uh, in a bit. Uh, and uh, the, it, it can also, in some cases, make advisory reports uh, with some, in some instances. Um, and so that if your activity, if an activity requiring a permit um, is also the subject of a, of a zoning application, a special permit or site plan, or a subdivision application, then they are not supposed to act on the application until they get your report. Um, and now your report could simply be just your decision and the minutes from the decision. It might not, it's not always you know, in, in the form of a report, but Commission towns that have staff, they sometimes uh, have full, you know, sort of full-time staff. Sometimes they will take your decision and turn it into something that looks like a report. But but it's your decision really gets disseminated to the to the planning and zoning in Weathersfield planning and zoning commission. So whether it's a subdivision or it's one of the uh, site plan or a special permit, your decision will go to it, and it has to give due consideration to your report. Now, the Zoning Commission, Planning and Zoning Commission doesn't become the wetlands commission, so it doesn't take a do-over, and it's not bound by what you say, uh, but it, in your, your report is relevant to one of its considerations that it can, it can rely on. Um, I already mentioned that, um, that uh, the DEEP can, over, you know, can assume your responsibilities, but I'm not aware of that ever happening, uh, and, and uh, I'm sure that's not any risk for, for you folks. So there, there's definitions. I'm not gonna read them all. They, they're in your, in your regulations, but you should be familiar with them. And your regulations you know, tie to the general statute with these uh, um, you know, regulated activity. I will touch on, on some of these definitions. But, uh, regulated activity means an operation within or use of a wetland or water course involving removal or deposition material or any obstruction, construction, alteration, or pollution, or wetlands or water courses, ex excluding the activities um, under 22A40, which I'll touch on in a minute. So that's a very broad definition. If you're doing an activity, unless it's exempted under 22A-40, it's hard to envision uh, any kind of work or any kind of construction that you do within a wetland that would not fall under that, that broad definition which again would give you folks the authority to review and approve the activity directly in the wetland. But you have to do that after you consider uh, the various factors that are in both in the act and, and are also adopted in the regulation. Uh, 
Um, you know, you know, there's a definition, I won't read the definition of wetland, but as we talked about, it's based on the National Soil uh, Survey and, and, and certified soil scientists would, would be identifying whether it's one of the kinds of soil that um, is poorly drained or, or otherwise one of the kinds of soils that are recognized as wetland. Uh, water courses are uh, defined as, you know, river streams, brooks, waterways. It, it's really the common, your common understanding of what it was. There was a point in time, though, that I actually had, you know, one quick war story. I actually represented someone who had uh, land in, in Litchfield, and they just wished it was on an existing road. They weren't doing anything other than putting some houses. But unfortunately, they were proposing to do that next to a land use lawyer's house. So he had the ability to uh, fight tooth and nail. And he argued, uh, and this is before an amendment to the act, which I'll touch on, that that basically scour that was coming off the, the, the there was no stormwater management system on this road in, in a rural part of Litchfield. So during storm events, water would rush off the road and would create scour. And he asserted that those things should be considered uh, water courses. And I'll never forget that I, we had nine hours uh, of public hearings on this application in which there was no other activity that was anywhere near any, any wetland. Um, and and a, a local golf club came in and they wanted to move the river. They literally wanted to move a river in the middle of the golf course. And their, their application was opened, closed, and a decision to grant the permit was done in 15 minutes. And uh, I had nine hours dealing with water that was coming off the road. So what, not necessarily because of that case, but maybe you know, in part in others, uh, the legislature uh, amended the act to define what an intermittent water course is. Uh, because there's certainly instances, you know, that that water will run, uh, you know, through locations, and you know, somebody might say, well, that, like in the case I just talked about, well, that's a water course because during main, you know, storm events, there's the water that running through the land. It, there has to be two of the following uh, criteria. There has to be uh, evidence of scour or deposits of recent alluvium or detritus. Now, that's, you know, in the situation I talked about, that was true. Uh, but there has to be presence of standing or flowing water for a duration longer than a particular storm event uh, and the presence of hydrophytic vegetation. So uh, the water, if, if there isn't some flow that continues uh, that uh, beyond a storm event, and when I say beyond a storm event, when it stops raining, obviously the water is going to continue to, to flow for some period of time. Uh, but it, if that's, that's it, then it's not uh, an intermittent water course unless there's hydrophytic vegetation. So you need two or three of those things to be an inter intermittent water course. If not, then it, it wouldn't be subject to it. Um, now, how far can you go um, regulation, regulating activities that are not in the wetland? The Connecticut Supreme Court way back in 1981, um, it, the, you know, I say way back in the sense that, you know, the, the Wetlands Act wasn't adopted until uh, the mid seventies, the decided that if there, there's an activity that um, is occurring in an upland that could have the effect of polluting uh, a wetland, then that activity is in and of itself a regulated activity. Now, the, the, that area where the activity is occurring is not the area that you're trying to protect. You're trying to protect the wetlands or the water course. So there needs to be some evidence uh, that you base a decision if you were gonna not allow somebody, because this is an area that, that is, you know, probably most heavily challenged is when uh, a commission is, is forcing somebody you know, further and further, farther and farther away from a wetland. Um, and so if you are gonna have, some people would call it a buffer, I think more often regulated, you know, regulated area. There's case law that said that if you define, create a bright line test, if there's even, a, you know, they even upheld a situation where if your property contains wetlands, regardless of where the activity is, you have to file an application with a wetland permit. That's a bit extreme. More often, there's there's a def definition where if you do activity within a certain distance from a wetlands, you've got to go through and get a permit. And the reason being is if you're that close, it's not because that upland area is in and of itself the environmental resource that you're protecting, but because if you do activity that close to a water course, you know there's a, a much higher chance that there's going to be siltation, um, some other kinds of pollution that's going to uh, be caused. The wetlands from the activity in close proximity. And so, 
you know, setbacks, buffer, and, you know, and even regulated area are all terms that, that are used. And that all is based on, you know, what your regulations. There is some recommendations uh, for deep um, for the separation distance of 100 feet. There is also some, in some instances, 200 feet. Uh, not as much 200 as a regulatory line, but in some instances, there might be some activities near really uh, fragile resources that a, a larger distance might be recommended by, by deep. Uh, but as I just said, the purpose of it is you, you can't automatically bar activities within a certain distance. So if, if an applicant comes in um, and is able to demonstrate that their activity while relatively close to the wetland is, is, is done in a way that will avoid any impact of the wetland, then they should qualify for it. Now, um, there was a case in which the, uh, and it was downstate, uh, that there were vernal pools, which you, you may all know, but just in case you don't, uh, there are small bodies of water that essentially exist only in the spring. They dry up in the summer. And the, what the, they're, they're, one of their important functions is because they're not connected to uh, water courses that would, you know, brooks and streams that would have fin fish in them, uh, they, they are an area where amphibians can, can more safely breed. And not get you know, picked up by picked off by the fish, and so they are very important. And there was a spotted salamander that relied on a vernal pool that was involved in the Avalon uh, Bay case that, that cited it from 2003. And what the Connecticut Supreme Court said is that you know the activity was actually impacting the salamanders themselves. The vernal pools weren't being affected. But the activity because the, the salamanders had to get from point A to point B. The development was going to in fact the species themselves and the supreme connecticut supreme court said that's not what the wetland act does the wetland act protects the wetlands uh and if there happens to be impact to a species in an upland area that's not something that the commission had the authority to raise now that led to changes in statute and uh, so what the change in the statute again there's a lot in the in the statute that that is really a balancing act but what the that amendment to the statute did to balance it, is it, it defines the actual aquatic plant and animal life as if it's a wetland or water course. So, the, so that the species that rely on uh, the, uh, the wetlands or the water courses become a regulated resource in and of itself so that you can deny something because a salamander is going to be harmed, but only only if the activity also involves some kind of an activity that will have uh, will change will likely change the physical characteristics of the, of the wetlands or watercourse itself. So, if somebody is is filling a portion of a wetland and they're also their activity is also going to affect a, a species that that uses that resource, uh, then both the protection of the wetlands and the protection of, you know, the salamander that might be traveling from point A to point B or something that you could base your denial on. But the hook is you always need some, some evidence that there'll be a likely impact on the physical characteristics of the wetlands. So now I mentioned 22A40 uh, before, and that is, there, there's two categories. I've never really understood why they, just didn't all include them as in, in one list. But there's a, there are permitted by right activities, and then there are non-regulated activities. But they're virtually the same thing, because if something's permitted by right, they don't need to get a permit. Uh, and if something's not regulated, they obviously don't need to get a permit. The one that's, that, that really gets, I think, the most attention in, in among them is agricultural activities. Um, and I know Weathersfield on the one hand is not, you know, the, the agricultural hub of, of Connecticut. There are agricultural activities in Weathersfield and you could, you could face this. And what it authorizes, this is one where they can do work directly in a wetland. If someone wanted to plant uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and run plows through, et cetera, uh, right through the middle of the wetlands, then that can happen uh, by right. And so 
the you know I'll touch on I'll I'll, I'll spoiler alert it'll come up in a slide in in a little bit but I, I will I will tell you that you have the jurisdiction to decide whether you have your whether or not something falls under one of these exceptions so if there is you could require and some regulations very specifically do that if you're going to undertake an activity that you believe is permitted by right you must you know present uh, you know you you must come before the commission to just demonstrate that you qualify. So there's a case that have said that you do have jurisdiction to decide whether you have jurisdiction, uh, but if it's related to the activities. Now, the, um, there's an exception to the exception. In other words, it, in the second sentence, there's activities that could be, you know, to some degree related to, to uh, an agricultural use that is still permitted by right. And that is uh, the, that, that exception should not be included, construed to include road construction or the erection of buildings not directly related to farming operation, relocation of watercourses with continual flow, filling uh, or reclamation of wetlands or watercourses with continual flow, um, clear cutting or timber, except for the expansion of, of agricultural cropland. So you can expand actual cropland by, by clear cutting and uh, mining uh, of, of material for the purposes of leasing. So what does all that mean? Well, there was a case at one point that suggested that, that it, if you had to put fill to build a road related, even if it's related to farming, that that was not uh, exempted and you'd have to get a permit. Well, the Supreme Court just recent, relatively recently disagreed and said that since the language there said that it must, if it's not directly related to farming, they said, well, then if it is directly related to farming, it's not regulated. So if a barn, somebody wished to put a barn right in the middle of wetlands, somebody wished to put a farm road in right through wetlands, including filling, uh, that is under the exemption and can be done um, without oversight by your commission, other than, you know, making sure, like, for example, you know, filling, um, if it's, if it's um, the, the road construction is permitted, but if somebody just wished to, flow, to fill just for the sake of, of, of filling, then, uh, if it's continual flow wetland, then that's something that, that would not be subject to, to the exemption. So uh, there's another one uh, for residential homes for which a building permit has been issued uh, on a subdivision uh, that's, been, that, that's been permitted, um, boat anchorage, um, uses that are related to normal, reasonable use of, of your of enjoyment of, of a residential home. That doesn't mean you can go and, and uh, you can't, you know, remove or deposit materials into a wetland. But if you're going to do an activity, you know, your your kids are running around and they run through a wetland to go get to another field. Um, that's something that that's not considered a regulated activity that they have to get a permit to do. Um, water companies have there's an exemption regarding water company companies. There's an exemption regarding maintenance regarding certain drainage pipes. Um, and <clears throat> fire departments removing water from water courses is also something that's permitted by right. Now there's a list of things that are not regulated. Again, I don't really know why they did it this way, but they must have had a good reason for it. But the practical effect for you is the same. Um, and that they, there's provided that the activity does not disturb the natural and indigenous character of a wetland or water course by removal or deposition of material. So if there's you know, removal, if you're, you're gonna take the material out or fill it, this entire section doesn't apply. Uh, but if you're not doing that and you're not altering or obstructing the water flow, you're able to undertake conservation activities directly within a wetland without uh, getting a permit. Outdoor recreation, which also I think applies under the residential one, but if you have land where there's no residents, but you're using it for you know activities, you know hiking, horseback riding, you know pin diving, camping, boating, water skating, listing, hunting, uh, et cetera, those things can be done. Uh, without any oversight by your commission. Dry hydrants are another one, um, or uh, dredging uh, for the purposes when it's conducted by a state agency uh, does not require uh, local approvals. That's pretty much the truth in any event. State agencies are not subject to local local permitting authority you know, by planning and zoning or wetlands. So I've already touched on this. Um, you can uh, you have the authority to determine jurisdiction. Your regulations can also give your enforcement officer, you know, someone in the uh, land use department um, or building department, the authority to determine whether or not there's uh, there's jurisdiction. 
Now enforcement, uh, the different kinds of enforcement include uh, the agency or officer or um, you know, your commission, usually it's an official, can issue a cease and desist order. And if they do that, then your commission has to have a show cause hearing within 10 days. Um, so that would come not from your commission. That's something that comes from, because your commission would be the one that would hold a hearing, that would be an enforcement order from, from your agent. And if that's done, then you have to have a hearing within 10 days and the person who's received it has to come present to you good cause why the enforcement order could be lifted. And you have the ability to, to lift it if they've demonstrated to your satisfaction that there is no, no violation. The other thing you can do is bring an enforcement action directly in court. Now you can do both of these things. You can you know, issue an order, have your hearing, decide that it doesn't you know, qualify for um, that the enforcement officer was correct, it's a violation, and they still proceed, um, or you just want to get uh, a court remedy anyway, you can go to court, or you can go directly to court. Um, and unlike zoning, you know, the penalties, because you were, in a way, acting uh, as an arm of the state, because all towns have to have a wetland agencies, courts imposing penalties, the penalties, which are are pretty severe. They can be up to $1,000 a day. Uh, they can be up to six months in prison if a state's attorney finds that it, it's worthy of a criminal arrest. Uh, and the any penalties that are awarded or fines, whether it's penalty in a civil court or fine in a uh, criminal court, those funds go to uh, the agency, the D, not the town. But it also provides that your attorney's fees, if you had to bring a lawsuit, uh, your attorney's fees would be added to the remedy that, that would be granted by the court. So provided the, you know, the, the offender has the resources to pay the attorney's fees, it um, wouldn't, wouldn't be out any money uh, for uh, bringing an enforcement action. Uh, citizens also have the ability, I've got that doubled, I'm not sure why, uh, but citizens have the ability to bring their own environmental enforcement action under uh, a section of 22A called the Environmental Protection Act. So they could bring a direct suit if they believe you, you know, that your commission, your enforcement officer wasn't taking action and a wetland was being harmed. A citizen has the ability, and you know, it's been referred to as a, a, a little attorney general or many attorney general who, who brings uh, a suit on behalf of the benefit of the environment. So that's the uh, the summary of you know, the, basically the legal parameters of where you get your authority and, and how, how you exercise it. Um, and I, I didn't, there, there's criteria 22A41 has a list of criteria that you consider. Um, and one other uh, aspect to that is if there is, that I don't have on the slideshow, but I will mention is if there is direct activity that you find is going to have harm and you're considering approving it, one thing you have to do is you have to consider whether there's a feasible and prudent alternative. And actually, the applicant has the burden to do that. The applicant has to show you if they're going to do an activity that you find um, is going to have a harm in the wetlands. Now, that doesn't mean a significant, your regulations have the provision for a significant activity. If something's a significant activity, then you have a public hearing. Um, and if you find that it's in the public interest to need to have a public hearing, you can have a public hearing. And the public can file a petition that wasn't in the original act, but more, more recently it was amended. So the, the citizens can petition for you to have a hearing on a, on a wetlands application. Um, and so uh, those things you do. Now, just because you determine something significant at the initial stages, because that's what you have to do right at the beginning to decide whether you have to have a public hearing. You haven't heard all the evidence yet. You've seen the application from based on what you've seen, you make a determination significant, should have a public hearing. During the public hearing, it is possible that the applicant is gonna present experts, gonna present all kinds of great evidence that, to, that satisfies you that the wetlands are actually not gonna be harmed at all. And you could make a determination, you could grant a permit and say that, the, that they're not gonna be harmed at all. Or you can make a determination that yes, there's gonna be impact in the wetlands, but I'm going to permit it. If you're going to permit it, then uh, one thing that you need to do is if the applicant needs to do is show that there's nothing, no other way that they could reasonably use the land uh, without 
uh, having this kind of an, an impact. And they're supposed to do that by submitting some drawings, some plans that show an alternative or one or more alternatives that they considered before proceeding and asking to, to do the direct impact. Um, and as long as you, you know you find that there is no feasible improvement alternative to what's being proposed, uh, then you can go ahead and, and permit an activity that will have an, you know an adverse impact to the wetland, but one that you all things considered because you do weigh economic benefit uh, and, and the re environmental resources, all things considered, you think it's, it's worthy of a permit, you can grant it as long as you've gone through that exercise. So, my next session is, is holding holding meetings, holding hearings, uh, and and I will, by the way, at the end of this, we'll we'll keep some time if you do have any any questions. Uh, but the, the the processing of the application, I mentioned, if you know you fail to act on something, somebody can uh, act to send it to deep. Uh, but the ordinary course, you're subject to the same time frames that that. Planning and zoning commissions, planning, zoning, or planning and zoning commissions are obligated to follow. And that is um, the application is considered received either at your, the next, at the, the regularly scheduled meeting after it's filed. So if it was filed yesterday, um, your night would be the official receipt day, even though you might have not had an opportunity to really even look at it. It would be the receipt day for the purposes of processing it. Um, you know, for some reason, you don't have a regular meeting, uh, it gets canceled, you know, weather, quorum, no business, whatever. The statute provides that 35 days after the application is received, it's it, it filed, it's considered to be received for the purposes of doing the math on how quickly a decision has to be made. Then the next question is whether there's a public hearing. Um, if there's no public hearing, then the application should be decided within 65 days. Uh, now, the applicant can grant extensions to any of these deadlines I'm talking about now, up to 65 days. Um, and in fact, I know in, in, I'll touch on that in a minute about possibility of even granting more, which ordinarily I don't recommend, but in, in the context of a wetlands commission, you could consider it in some circumstances. Uh, back to the specifics of the statute, a, if a public hearing is required, then that hearing needs to be opened within 65 days. Once it's opened, it's supposed to be closed within 35 days. And then once uh, it's closed, the decision should be rendered within 65 days. So you got a longer period. And again, the applicant could grant 65 days to, and, and mismatch them anyway. If you need an extra week uh, to open up the hearing and then the hearing's open and they want an extra you know, week uh, to keep the hearing open, then you'd still have the balance of all those 65 days to, to work with. Uh, now, the, there are applications in which uh, the, the uh, a zoning commission or planning commission, if they don't act, an application is automatically approved if the deadline isn't met. That's a subdivision or a site, subdivision and resubdivision or a site plan. Um, other kinds of applications like a special permit uh, or a zoning change regulation, those are not um, don't get automatically approved. What the Supreme Court said is even though the statute says shall, that you shall follow these deadlines, it's, it's directory rather than mandatory. And the only times in which there's a consequence for failing to act is if the, leg if the statute specifically says so. And the statute regarding site plans and the statute regarding subdivisions specifically says so. It says that if you don't take action within the deadlines of, of that statute, uh, then they're considered automatically approved. It doesn't say that in the Wetlands Act. And there's a case actually called Karen versus the town of Berlin, uh, in which the Supreme Court specifically said, if you miss these deadlines, that does not result in an automatic approval of the wetlands permit. You should still follow it. Uh, but you know, if, if you did miss it, it's not the same kind of a deal breaker it is in some, some context of zoning and planning. Uh, now, the other thing is if there really was an important reason to go beyond these deadlines, uh, that you should ask the applicant for, even if the applicant's used up 65 days, and this should be a really unusual circumstance. You should be able to get business done under these deadlines. But if for some reason something new comes in at the very end and, and people want to have an expert look at it and present something and your commission thinks it's really important to get it and you're right at, right at the end, um, if you get the applicant to agree in writing for the additional extension, the applicant should not have standing to argue that 
your commission acted illegally in, in following his, the, the agreement made by the applicant. So you do have some latitude. I recommend have, doing that uh, if you can avoid it, but there is you know, an ability to do it without fear that it'll be automatically approved or that the, you know, the applicant will be able to somehow reverse it and get a permit approved simply because you went beyond the statutory deadlines, including the extensions of time. So the differences between public meetings and public hearings uh, is, is an important one. I use the analogies, if you're given permission to, to go and watch the General Assembly do its business, um, the, you wouldn't have the ability to you know, raise your hand and, and just start talking about some bill that's before the General Assembly. You watch, you can listen, but you don't have the ability to comment. And, and that is the case for any regular meeting item if you decided not to have a public hearing on something. And that's what the Wetland Act gives the ability if citizens think it's such a critical thing to be heard on, they can file a petition, it can be, it can be a public hearing. Not, the public has no right to do it. You have some discretion if you think that information, you know, it's, it's your prerogative, but if you, you want to on a regular business item, somebody has information that you think would be valuable for your consideration, there's no legal prohibition against you allowing somebody to present some information. Um, but generally speaking, the, the regular meeting, you know, you, people can be there, but uh, it's only it's only you folks that, that do the talking. A public hearing is the other story. Now, every now and then people think that, you know, they, different commissions do it different ways. Some commissions want people to write their names down. I, I haven't been at a hearing at yours, and I don't know exactly what, what you do when people wish to speak. Uh, but people from any member of the public, not just people who live in Wethersfield, but anybody can come and speak at a public hearing. Uh, you can require them to identify themselves, identify you know where they where they live, but you can't stifle them because they live in Newington. Um, the uh, general general procedures, although there's some latitude, but usually the sequence of of a, of a public hearing is. Um, it, that the applicant would present first. Some commissions would start with the with the commissioners asking questions. That's unusual. I think more often the applicant will make his presentation, and then the commission <clears throat> uh, might uh, ask questions right then. Some commissions wait until after everybody is heard, and then they'll ask their questions. But I think more commonly, when the applicant ends, the chairman would ask the you know members of the commission have any questions of the applicant before we go on to the public. The advantage of that is you know what you're doing, you know what some of the pressure points your regulations are, and you might want to make, if the applicant has not done a particularly good job of commenting on something that you think is essential, you might as well ask the question, have it addressed before the public gets up there and asks the same, same thing. You might uh, be able to head that off. Um, and then after the applicant, then the public gets to be heard. Again, it's there's different, different practices for different commissions. Uh, some will ask for people in favor, then followed by people who are opposed, followed by people that are either in favor or opposed, but wish to speak. Uh, and other commissions, it can be just in the order they sign up or in the order they get to the podium uh, or you know, on a virtual meeting, you know, just the order in which people's hands are raised, uh, which is, you know, it's hard to know. It, it's almost, you have to do it that way with a virtual setting because um, I, I guess you could say, who's anybody opposed, please raise your hand and you go through it that way. But often you know, people aren't you know, necessarily following that. When they want to be heard, they'll, they'll hit the raise hand and, and uh, request to be heard. But that, you know, that, that is some prerogative that you have. Now, uh, you could put time limitations on people speaking, but understand that everyone has a, 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 if it's a public hearing, parties have a right to a fundamentally fair hearing. So if an applicant comes in, and an applicant presents, you know, I, I just on one down in, you know, in the eastern part of the state, uh, where the presentation by the applicant was two and a half hours long. And the, you know, if the commission then said you to to someone, a group, neighborhood group hires, you know, a guy like me wearing a, you know, a suit and a tie to come in and make a presentation and hire experts and put it all on, and the commission said we well, have three minutes. Uh, that's not a fundamentally fair process. People, if you know, the applicant is able to present experts on several topics, and I've engaged, you know, I on behalf of my client have engaged a number of experts to be heard. You've got to give, you know, sort of a reasonably fair time to be able to do that. And what some commissions might do is limit 
the first round, we'd like people to speak, you know, if it's a controversial one and the room is filled, you know, re remind them, please, you know, need to repeat yourself. You know, we're, we apply the regulations. It's not a popularity contest. So, um, you know, we, we understand, but if you don't have additional information, we understand this is important to you when you're here, uh, but just repeating the same thing somebody else said is, is not helpful to the commission. So we'd ask you to try to avoid doing that. Um, and then after everyone's had an opportunity to speak, uh, if you did limit times, you then should give the floor again to people who, who weren't able to complete what they wanted to present within the three three minutes. And that way you're assured uh, that that no one's being you know, stifled and given a reasonable opportunity so that they won't take an appeal and say they've been denied you know, due, you know, due process. Um, and due process, and I think I already said it, due process is not the same thing as constitutional due process. Uh, but it is a right to what's called fundamental fairness. So it's, it's a somewhat subjective view, but that would be clearly not fundamental, it would be fundamentally unfair if in the situation I just told you, somebody comes in with uh, a series of experts to rebut what the applicant did over the course of two and a half hours and you gave, gave me as the counsel to this opponent five minutes, uh, that wouldn't be fundamentally fair. Experts present a, a, a particularly important element for wetlands agencies. There's a lot of zone, there's zoning issues. There's some law that, that deals with zoning that says that a planning and zoning commission or a zoning commission is particularly suited to understand um, what the, uh, the impacts of traffic are and understand traffic uh, in, in the community. And so a traffic uh, expert comes in, the commission doesn't necessarily have to believe the traffic expert. Um, now, if the traffic expert has done a measurement of, you know, the distance for a site distance out of a driveway, you know, the commission can't say, I don't believe it. Uh, you know, they need some basis to, to reject that. But generally speaking, you know, traffic volumes and things like that, traffic patterns, the commission can rely on its own judgment. The wetlands commission is different. Um, the case law has, has found that, that impact on a wetland is a, is a very technical thing. And lay persons on a commission uh, can't disregard expert testimony on the topic of impacts to wetlands. So if an applicant comes in uh, and uh, it, just because they, they have an expert, they, their expert might testify on things that are, are really not relevant to, to the activity. Uh, so, you know, there, there are several aspects of an activity. One of them is right smack dab in the middle of the wetland and an expert comes in and talks about, you know, the construction of a home 100 feet from a wetland. And that's all the expert talks about. Well, that doesn't mean that the expert has testimony you got to rely on with respect to the activity directly in the wetlands. But if there is activity and that's near the wetlands, uh, for example, or if there's a question about whether something's an intermittent water course, whether something's uh, an actual wetlands based on soil science. If that kind of an expert comes in, you can't disregard that expert testimony. You don't have the ability because you're late people. Now, what can happen is the battle of the experts. My scenario I mentioned before, where somebody comes in to oppose an application, they have their own expert. The applicant had his, his own expert. Yeah, kind of like the jury there. If you're in a medical malpractice case, you're going to have two doctors who are going to decide. One's going to say, no, that appendectomy was done perfectly. And it was, you know, unfortunate circumstances about an infection that was really outside the control of the physician. And another expert says, not so. The, this, the, the surgery was not performed correctly. The surgeon needed to do this, that, or the other thing. Uh, and they did that uh, she didn't. And then as a result of that, uh, the person has, uh, was injured. The jury then listens to all of that and decides which expert is more credible. Even though they're not surgeons, they get to listen to all of that. The decision. And that's what it would be like if two different experts are button heads on whether something's a wetland. And then your decision in deciding which one's more credible shouldn't be interfered with by a court. The court lets you, like a, just like a jury, gets to decide who decides. Cross-examination, usually again, people wearing ties would be the only people walking in and trying to say, I want to cross-examine. A chairman could have questions come through the chair just to keep the quorum. But if somebody says, I would like to directly ask this engineer question, or I would like to specifically ask the soil scientist question, and they ask that, they're entitled to do that. There's, a, there's cases that say that, so that um, you know that they can get to the truth. Uh, you know, some you know, cross examination is the best way to get to the truth. Um, doing it through the chair can can be cumbersome. So if someone asks to do cross examination, they're entitled to it. Site visits, um, you can certainly do that. 
Um, one of the cases I was involved in, in, in actually it was related to the one I gave you the, the war story about that there was the, uh, the scour, uh, that one of the challenges to, we got an approval ultimately after a long, long hearing process, there was a site visit and the neighbor was, did not, wasn't provided specific knowledge that there was gonna be a site visit and claimed that that was part of the public hearing. The court decided that it was not part of the public hearing and that he wasn't, he wasn't entitled uh, to, to be there or entitled to specific notice to be there. Now, if you're gonna have a quorum of people there, um, it's a good idea to, to notice it as a meeting. There's a recent Supreme Court case that would suggest that, uh, well, the, the Freedom of Information Commission has taken the position that when, when commissions try to avoid a meeting by going out with less than a quorum, um, that doesn't do the trick. It's still considered uh, you know, a meeting, even if you're less than a quorum. Well, a recent Supreme Court case suggests otherwise. It was a situation not on the Wetlands Commission, but it was a situation in Wallingford uh, council, uh, the outgoing town manager wanted to work on a motion for the process of hiring a new town manager. And the majority leaders from both parties met with the town manager. Well, the majority of both parties together constituted a quorum. So you might think, well, it's a quorum of the commission doing some business related to the commission. The Supreme Court said they weren't. They didn't have any power. They, they didn't, it wasn't a meeting. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't a meeting where they could make a decision. They were just working on a motion that they were going to then present to the full council for consideration. So that that meeting of people was not a meeting for the purposes of FOI. So under the same, and, and the exception would be if a group of, of, of a larger body, a group of the council or a group of your commission were charged to go gather evidence and to conduct some kind of a hearing and bring it back to the commission, well, then that group that's, that, that would be performing uh, a specific task and would have some power to be doing something. If you're just getting information, uh, that's not, a, you know, you're not independently empowered to do anything. So that if you did visit in groups of less than a quorum, we believe that the Supreme Court case would allow that it would not be a violation of the FOI. But it still might be a good practice and, and commissions often have a practice if they do them, they'll notify them as a public meeting, people walk the site, um, you don't talk about anything there other than, you know, finding out where things are. You know, if you do have questions and it's answered, and you get back to the public public process, if it's a public hearing, you put out a record. You know, we were there, the applicant said that, you know, that there's, you know, that there's crossing, you know, X, Y, Z, anything that, that you might rely on as part of your decision. If it's not part of the public hearing, you'd have a problem. So if something was gathered during the site visit other than just general understanding of the site, um, you could put it on the record. Um, so the kinds of decisions you can issue, you can just issue a plain old approval, uh, you could modify um, it. Maybe there's an activity that's being proposed and the, maybe the plans have a, you know, there was a mistake in the plans and you did, or that an applicant during the course of the hearing says, okay, I'll modify, I'll be, I'll agree that I'll move my, you know, house and the septic system back 10 feet. Well, you could approve subject to the modification that, you know, the house on lot one, be moved to the north by 20 feet or whatever you know you've decided or with the commission. That would be a modification of the plans, an approval with a modification. A conditional approval is when you're when you're imposing certain requirements, you're imposing the requirement to bond, you're imposing a requirement um, that that sill fence be installed, which is you know very common. That's a very common condition. You know, that, that that soil erosion controls be put in place, a condition that um, other other particular activities have to occur in association with that. Those are, those are conditions that are being added to uh, the, the approval. A, a, a decision without prejudice, some commissions like to say that, I mean, as long as you give guidance to an applicant as to why you're denying it, if it's a technical denial, well, you, you know, you needed this, uh, you needed this analysis of species, our regulation 6.78, says that you have to you have to do an inventory of species you didn't do it so you need to do it i'm denying it well that's really a denial without prejudice because you've given you know the direction of the reason you've denied it it doesn't mean you're going to approve it if they fix that problem uh, but 
you at least have given them an indication that if they, if they fix that problem, you'll consider the application. Uh, but if you wanted to, you can say without prejudice, which is just kind of an invitation to come back. Um, if you've said nothing and you deny it, the applicant really doesn't know. Did you deny it for some technical reason or did, they just, did you just decide, which is probably what most applicants would think, if you just decided that that activity is, you know, you've decided is not permissible um, as opposed to you deciding that you know there was some technical defect they, they failed to put something that the engineer didn't stamp a plan or you know they had the compass rose in the wrong direction or they missed it on the plan um and then obviously you can just deny reasons for denial i mean there there is an adage that not an adage but a premise that if you don't give any reason for denial uh then if it's appealed, what the court has to do is look at everything that's in the evidence, all the evidence in the record and see if there's a good reason for denial and whether it's supported by the evidence. So the less you say, that's better. That's not our recommendation. I mean, good planning, in, in, I say planning in the sense that um, good policy, I'll say, of, of people understanding why you have a concern with a particular application can guide other applicants, can, can guide that applicant. So, so some indication of, of, of the concerns that you have are, are usually a, a good idea, but you should make sure that the motion, you know, is well drafted, well thought out, um, and, you know, use, use staff to help uh, with motions and especially in controversial, controversial matters. Now, the next few slides are, are things that have to do with your participation, situations in which you need to, you know, be consider, consider as to whether or not you're going to act um, and the uh, possible grounds for recusal uh, could be because you have a conflict of interest. Now, there's no, that's, you know, that's nothing to be ashamed of. You, you could be best friends or it could be a very close family member um, or, you know, you're in business with or it's a direct competitor who wants to do something. There, there could be reasons why you have the kind of interest where if you put yourself in the shoes of somebody in the public and they were looking at it, would they think you'd be fair? Now, maybe you'd be tougher on your best friend than you'd be on anybody else. Um, and you know, in your heart of hearts, you wouldn't give that person any quarter, no favor whatsoever. That's not the way it's gonna look for the public. The public's gonna think that, that you, you're not unbiased. So you, you need to recuse yourself. If there would be an appearance of, of uh, an impropriety for you acting on it, the better part of judgment is to recuse yourself. Um, another would be, uh, prejudgment or ex parte evidence. What prejudgment uh, would be is, is basically you, you have some kind of bias. Uh, also, you know, I, I have a situation right now with the commission where um, there's a challenge by an applicant that a member of the commission improperly contacted its uh, consultant and was doing, you know, independent research on there. When in fact, what happened is the, the man's plans or the, this report was such small font, you couldn't read it. And he wanted to see if he could get a copy that he could read. Now, if that happens to you folks, talk to your staff and have your staff reach out to the applicant to get you a better copy rather than you do it directly. Because then you're going to avoid what's happening in this town right now, uh, where the applicant is claiming that you know there, there was impropriety, and now the opponents are claiming, well, now if you vote yes, it's because you've been bullied into it. So it created a problem that could be avoided. So doing doing that. Also consider yourself like judges. Your, your judges don't, you know, judges might wish the two parties came in and, and had some additional evidence, um, but you shouldn't go out and start doing research on your own and presenting evidence in, 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 into the record. Um, now, if the applicant doesn't present the stuff that they need to, it needs to, he needs to, she needs to, um, or they need to, the, what should happen is, you deny it because they haven't met the requirements. But to go in and try to fill in the blanks of something an applicant missed, uh, or if an opponent is not doing as good a job as, as you want, um, you really shouldn't do the in, independent because what that suggests is that you had a bias in favor or against the application. Now, if you have specialized knowledge, if one of you is a soil scientist, or one of you is a, a uh, civil engineer who's, who has great experience in analyzing stormwater systems, and that's what you do for a living. And that's one of the issues is whether or not the stormwater system is going to cause siltation into uh, a wetland. And you know you can evaluate this material and you have an opinion about it. You need to present your qualifications on the record during the hearing, or if there's no hearing, just present it to the applicant. And your your opinion, your your information. You can't wait and and uh, and sandbag an applicant, and after the whole hearing is done, 
you say, well, this is my experience, and I believe that Section 25.5 of the Connecticut Stormwater Manual provides that this is an impermissible, this system will not work, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the applicant might disagree with you and might be able to point you to a section, you know, a paragraph in that section that, that applies and is that, that demonstrates compliance, but the applicant is not given that opportunity because you've raised it for the first time after the close of the public hearing. So that's something that you need to do. And the same is true about with ex parte, if you haven't heard the term, it's, I'm not much for Latin, uh, so I can't tell you what, but I think it's, it's evidence that's out, something that you get outside. So if somebody came to you, there's actually a, a well-known wetland case is one of the, the best examples of this. Somebody came and there was a dispute about a, a well location and somebody went and handed a member of the commission a drawing saying, this is the location of the well that, I've, that I saw out on the property. It was not disclosed to the applicant. And then once the liberation started, this commissioner pulls out of uh, his pocket a drawing and says, you know, there's a problem here. This well is in a location that is in violation, et cetera, et cetera. The court, Supreme Court said that was inappropriate. That was not fundamentally fair for the applicant to bring that new evidence. So if you get something, somebody, if somebody approaches you at the gas station um, and wants to talk to you, you should say, you know, I, I can't do that. I'm on the commission. I'd love to hear from you. Please come to the meeting and, and you can present that information. But if it's something that you can't unsee, they handed you a picture and you saw it um, and you think it's relevant, you think it's something, I mean, if they handed you something that's a completely irrelevant, uh, you know, then, then you know, it, that's not something that you need, need to disclose because you're not going to rely on it. Uh, but if there's some information that you've seen, somebody hands it to you, what you should do is you should put it on the record. Come in and say, you know, I, I didn't ask for this, but, you know, Mrs. Smith, you know, I was at the gas station and she said, I've got something you've got to see and handed me this photograph and look at this. This is the applicant who's in, it, who's bulldozing right through the middle of the wetland. It's got a state on it. I think we need to take action on, on, on this or we keep the applicant's not credible in saying that he's not going to do this one and the other thing. That you give the opportunity for the applicant to say, oh, that, that wasn't me, that was CLMP. I, I, I had nothing to do with that. That, that look at that, see the, see the, the what he's wearing or ever source now, I guess. Um, and so they need the opportunity or he here, they need the opportunity to comment on that. Familiarity with the record. If you missed all the hearings and you haven't had a chance to familiarize yourself. I mean, one of the nice things about the hybrid stuff is you're gonna look at, you can actually look and see the, uh, see what happened. But if it was a regular meeting, an in-person meeting, you have the ability to listen to the tapes. You have the ability to look at notes if somebody had detailed notes. The number of things you can do, and you should state on the record if you were missing, that I've reviewed everything and I'm, I'm prepared to act. But if you haven't, you're busy, you were away, whatever, then you'd have to recuse yourself because you're not in a position to know the evidence of the record. Um, you have the ability to represent your own interests. Um, and so you can do that. You cannot represent other people in front of land use commissions. Uh, there's a statute that, that pro prohibits that. Um, but you, on your behalf, can recuse yourself. And, and take a position on your on your own behalf. You can't obviously advocate for yourself and still sit on, on the commission. Um, and uh, so, when when you if you do have a conflict, it's also a good idea to say what it is. Um, the idea that somebody just recuses themselves and goes and sits down and, and leaves the table um, or leaves the room. And frankly, that's our recommendation. If you if you need to recuse if you need to recuse yourself because you haven't you're not familiar with the record, that's a different story. But if you have to recuse yourself because you have personal or financial interest in the application, you should leave. And we texts and cell phones now when, when that item is gone, because there are cases where, where somebody, you know, long drawn out battle because someone's saying that commissioner sat there and, and scowled and every time somebody wanted to talk, shook, shook his head uh, and, and did a number of things to try to influence the commission on a matter that, that uh, he had a, a, a conflict. So, you avoid that altogether if when you accuse yourself, you leave the room. And you could say, it's my best friend, it's my cousin. I, you know, this is, I'm in this business and this is my direct competitor. What it is, there's no, it, it, rather than shame, is actually honor and, uh, and, and being open about, you know, the reason that you might accuse yourself rather than just mysteriously walk away. 
Um, so I'm not gonna go through a lot of detail th this about financial interest includes your personal finance, but also financial interest of people who are very close to you. Um, and so now, you know, you can be involved in organizations, you know, if there are, you know, just because you're in the same, you know, you, you might be a member of you know, the church or, or you, you know somebody that, you know, you, you knew, you know, you went to grade school with, but you're not a particularly good friend, you don't get together with them. I mean, small, small enough town, you're going to know a lot of people. So there's a there's a balance. So the financial interest is the same thing. How close does somebody need to be to me? Um, so if it's a very good friend, if it's a fit, close family member, if they have a financial interest. It's like you have a financial interest, and you should um, you should uh, step down. Um, and kind of touched on personal interest and how close you are to the applicant, how distant you are. Um, you know, they, there's no bright line test. They they, they um, the court will look at it. You know under the facts of any given case. But if you own property very close to, to an applicant's, you know, the, the, the wise course of action would, uh, would be to recuse yourself. Now, if you've determined, the commission can't make you sit, can't make you recuse yourself. Each of you have your own responsibility to decide as a, as a public official, whether you're able to sit. Um, and, and, and when you decide, contrary to what I said before, we have a conflict, but you decide I don't have a conflict, it's a good idea to state on the record. If somebody thinks you're biased, it's a good idea to say, I don't have any bias against this applicant. I'm going to decide this application based on the evidence. I have an open mind, and I'm going to decide by applying the evidence to the regulations. If somebody says that, courts will often look at that and say, look, this commissioner was serious, understood his, his or her responsibilities with their responsibilities, and they... Um, it, it adhered to that. So I'm going to take the commissioner uh, at the, the word stated uh, rather than, you know, assume that there was some kind of a bias. So it's a good idea to put that kind of thing on the record. If you're, if you've been challenged and you really, and you decide after considering the things I'm talking about, that you are fully qualified to participate, um, you can, you could state why, you know, even some, oh, somebody's your, your dear friend. You might say, I haven't seen that person in 30 years. Uh, in fact, I don't even like, I mean, I'm, I'm joking now, but I, mean, I don't even like the person who pulled my chair out from under me when I was in third grade. Uh, and so getting more information out there is, is generally better um, if, you know, using common sense. Uh, bias, you know, kind of in, in, in prejudgment. I mean, one thing that we would say, and in, in I actually it came out of deep training, uh, but I actually use it in training planning and zoning commissioners because it's a great example. But um, I'll use the Connecticut River, in, 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 although we use the Farmington River as an example in some of the training. But if if someone is proposing something on on the Connecticut River, and you you say in the meeting or publicly otherwise uh, that you know nobody is going to propose anything within 200 feet of the Connecticut River um, and that I'll approve. On the other hand, if you said Connecticut River is a very important resource. And in, if someone is going to do work in close proximity to that, that river, they're going to have to be sure to demonstrate to this commission that that is not gonna have an adverse impact on that important resource. So in the first example, you've expressed bias, prejudice. You've, you've decided the, deci the case before you've heard the evidence. The second one, you put the applicant on notice that this is you know, important consideration, that, that you take it very seriously but you haven't suggested that you have a closed mind. That's the key, is being open-minded um, and getting that in, on the, uh, uh, you know, if necessary, getting it on the record. Atmosphere of hostility, one of the cases it was, you know, judge looks at this stuff, the judge is, is likely to see it, going to see a transcript. She's not going to be in the room and understand that things might've been in jest. There was a case, I mean, it's decades old, so who knows if it would be decided exactly the same way, but there was an applicant who's of Italian descent, is clearly a member of the commission, was also Italian, but they, they started to be a series of Italian jokes were uh, in, in some of them, you know, with, with some stereotypes involved. And the court ultimately said that there was a, an, an atmosphere of hostility was created. So it doesn't necessarily have to, you know, it, it could be race, could be gender, could be, uh, you know, ethnicity, uh, but it, it doesn't even have to be those things. It could be, you know, suggesting that there's a bias against, you know, people who are, you know, <laughs> real estate agents or something. If you say something that when you see it in plain paper, even if it might have been in, not in, in depth, um, that it's not a good idea. So just, just 
think that that's the way the lens of court's going to look at that and not make it seem as though you you have some kind of a bias um, against a, an applicant or you know or frankly if, if an op opponent was up there and you said something that that suggested that you were prejudiced against their position that's important um, so, you know this is part and parcel of the same thing you know you don't you, know, you shouldn't be out there I mean we would advise you to stay off of public media in general, social media, um, you know, you should again think of yourself like a judge. You, know, you really shouldn't be out there advocating things uh, while you're on the commission. But in, and if you do in any context, uh, you know that can, you know, your statements can be used against you. Um, now that doesn't mean some people say, well, we can't preliminarily meet with an applicant before formal application comes in. No, 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 that's not what that means. If you know your commission has a practice, not all wetland commissions do. A lot of land, a lot of zoning. Planning and zoning commissions might have initial meetings, workshops to talk with an applicant about some of the things they ought to consider before they file an application. That's not that's not prejudice. That's just getting information from an applicant. Now, in that context, you shouldn't say, I'm never going to approve anything from you, because again, that would show the bias. Having preliminary discussions is not, is not prohibited. Um, I've already said you, you should state, I mean, there actually there's state, there's state law suggests you should state on the record your reason for refusal. It's not just good practice, but it is also a, a, a requirement. Um, this is, you know, I, I touched in there that you can have an ordinance that says who takes the place of people when they are when they are refused. Um, you know, meetings. Uh, you know, the chairman is key to keep control. It can set the tone. Like when I was talking about a public hearing before, if the if the uh, they, they there is a request that people you know put questions through the chair. The request that people, uh, you know, not repeat themselves. You know, so setting the basic ground rules at the beginning of a public hearing is very wise. And controlling, you know, not only the public, if some the public starts to talk about things that are irrelevant, you know, they're lay people, they're citizens of the town. I get it that you're, you know, often will allow somebody to ramble on on something that really might not be relevant. But you, you, the chairman has got to use reasonable discretion and be polite about it, but say, you know, you know, Mr. Smith, I, I understand you're passionate about that, and you're, you know, you're really opposed to, you know, the nuclear power plant at, at, down on the shore. But that really doesn't have anything to do with our application, where somebody wishes to put a house near a wetlands uh, here off of Nod Road. Uh, so, you know, you can, because you know, people really can get way off, way off on a tangent. Same thing if they're repetitive and they're saying thing over and over. Thank you very much. We understand. You, know, you, you have to use good judgment. The chairman is really important to do that. Um, parliamentary procedure, Robert's rules. For small groups, Robert's rule has one very important thing in the middle of it, which says these rules, you know, can be or should be relaxed in small groups. They're really involved for, you know, you have a town meeting with 500 people in a room and the moderator has to figure out how to move business and very the specific technical rules of motions and all of that um, and, and, you know, calling questions and, and all of that. Um, are, are more important. You can be less formal than that. In fact, Robert's rule says you only need seconds on motions uh, in small groups. It, it's a very common practice that, that motions and seconds are are used even for small you know, land use commissions. But just by way of example, Robert's rules are meant to try to help move business, not to try to stifle it. I had a couple of commissions where it, where someone has really used it like a sword to try to pretty much halt business by constantly you know, calling, calling for you know, rulings by the chair on, on this technical point of order, this point of order, that, um, you know, you gotta move business. That's, that's really what it's all about. Um, your motion should be clear, amendment should be clear. You should state what the motion is before the vote is so the public understands what um, has been done. And in your case with uh, having we have virtual meetings, you should have roll calls uh, when on the vote because it's very difficult for the public to know exactly who voted for what. Whereas if you're in a room and people are sitting there, who's saying I is a lot easier to so you should definitely use roll calls. You might do that even when you're in person meetings. Uh, but uh, the, uh, you definitely shouldn't just say all in favor, I, you know, who's opposed because you know, for all you know, 10 people in the public, um, you know, maybe they got ask, access to come off of mute and, and, uh, and they, they've said something. So uh, that's important. Um, I've already talked about significant activity. It may have significant activity is one thing I didn't specifically say. That's 
when you're early on, you can make the determination that something might have a significant activity. And that's when you have a public hearing, whether it's in the public interest or if somebody files a petition for 45 uh, days. Um, and here's the feasible and prudent alternative that, that I already talked about uh, a little bit, so I won't read the whole thing, but um, you shouldn't issue a permit that involves a, an impact unless you've considered that there aren't any feasible and prudent al alternatives. Um, and then, so the, you know, feasible is the ability or constructed or implemented consistent with sound engineering principles. Uh, and an alternative is a, a prudent, if economically and otherwise reasonable in light of the social benefits derived from the activity, provided costs may be considered, costs can be considered. Uh, and somebody might say, you know, you really should bridge that wetlands. And so you got a, a two lot subdivision and someone's proposing that you spend, you know, $85,000 on a bridge when there's another alternative that might have some modest impacts, uh, but will really protect the integrity of the wetland, you could find that that's not uh, a prudent alternative. So, so that's the balancing for uh, for that. And uh, we have already talked uh, about some of this, although I will touch on you know evidence. Um, if somebody does a demonstrative exhibit, if I did, if I was doing, I was the applicant and I was presenting this PowerPoint tonight, you need the PowerPoint. Um, and same thing with, with uh, photographs, videos, what have you. You need to have that in the record. So if there is appeal, you could uh, show that. So, um, and one, another thing about your decisions uh, with the Wetlands Commission, you shouldn't, based on speculative risk. Oh, what, what it should be is something that there's a, a reasonable likelihood of an impact. That's really what you're looking for. Evidence for you to determine that it's, there's a reasonable likelihood that there's an ad, the adverse impact. And if you have that, and then you can deny unless you find that that, um, although there's a reasonable likely of impact, you still can approve it if, based on all the considerations you do, um, you find that, uh, that it's appropriate. So quorum, you obviously know you were waiting till you had quorum tonight, you, you know what that is. Uh, and then votes are, you know, the majority of the quorum. Um, so it's not the majority of the members of the commission, it's the, the, the majority of, of them present. Um, alternates participation. Again, I'll, I'll do the analogy to uh, to uh, a jury. And in a, when a jury, an alternate is a full participant. Um, so sometimes people believe an alternate shouldn't be participating during a public hearing. They should, they can ask questions, they act just like everybody else because you don't know when the decision is gonna be made. Um, that hearing might get continued to next month's meeting. Three people might be absent and that alternate might be in the position of making a decision. So that alternate should be able to do the same as, as everybody else. But now, once the hearing's closed, and once they're at a point where the question is gonna be before the commission, the alternate should not participate. Only the seated people, the people who are gonna vote on the matter, should be participating in, in uh, the, the, uh, the discussion. Now, you know, there's a little bit of latitude. If you're considering regulation amendment changes and things like that, and it's a policy thing, Maybe that can be a bit relaxed, but certainly on an application where there, where somebody might have the ability to be taking an appeal, uh, then the the, the uh, alternate shouldn't participate. And a tie vote is a denial. An applicant has to get the necessary votes for an approval. In fact, that case actually comes out of Weathersfield, not a Weathersfield uh, Commission, the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, where there was a a tie vote and it was determined that it was the applicant's responsibility to get necessary votes. So. With that, um, if you have any questions, I'm uh, I'm all ears. So that was the, uh, and I'll end, I'll end the sharing. I can uh, help uh, at this point, but anybody certainly won't be offended if you don't have questions. But anything I, I haven't covered or I, I jumped over, you have a uh, question or concern about. I have a couple of questions. I'm I'm just a little. You went through the voting, uh, the numbers a little quick. And did I hear you right that you say it's the majority of those present at a meeting, provided you have a quorum, of course, and not a majority of the commission? Correct. I, do I? Okay. I, I sort of recall we've had situations say we've had five people out of the nine at a meeting, and that's a quorum. Yep. But I can recall. Um, say the chairperson, not not Brian, but you know, going back, mm -hmm. saying, well, if one person votes against it, then you run the risk of having the uh, 
uh, application denied. And in fact, giving the applicant advice, maybe you want to have us table it and wait till the next meeting. Uh, I, I do recall that situation happening in the past, but that well, do that with zoning. Happen. I do that with zoning board appeal. You know, I I have to say that I've not seen a, a wetland regulation that does that. Is anybody on the commission aware that you adopted a heightened requirement for a normal for irregular uh, a permit? Now, an enforcement like a zoning enforcement matter, that there's a an obligation that you have. Um, uh, that they get four votes. So every time the ZBA acts, they have to get four votes. So they regularly do just that. If they have the minimum right. number of people or even just have five, they say, you know, would you rather we defer to we have a full commission because, you know, if it's the minimum four, you need a unanimous vote. Five, you need, you need, uh, need one. So I can look after the fact, but I, I don't remember seeing a, a, an ordinary permit application um, that requires a heightened vote above the majority of the quorum, but I, I can double check that. And if you don't hear from me, then that means that I'm I'm right that, that it's just the majority of the quorum. Okay. But if you only have five people, I mean, you, you know, you'd still need you know you'd still need need three if I'm if you don't have a heightened requirement. Right. Right. Uh, one other question. Um, you mentioned uh, independent research. Uh, if I want to go out and take a look at a piece of property, an application, maybe I'm unclear on what the map looks like or whatever. I'm not a, in the construction trades or anything. Uh, can I do that? Yes. Is that, that's yes. just information. Yeah. Right. Okay. What I'm talking about is you go to the state law library and spend three days looking for as much information as you can uh, to present in opposition to an application that's before you. Yeah, you, you, you come, you, you, now that doesn't mean that you know you have knowledge as a member of the wetlands agency, and you have knowledge from something um, that you know you're aware that this particular kind of, of, of species is sensitive to. And you said, you know, I, I believe that it is. I think you know, Mr. You know, Mr. Mrs. Applicant, um, that you know, I think that you, you should. Can you please look into that? Because I think there's, you know, I have a concern about that. It's knowledge that you have, but if you go go so far as to be just digging and rooting around for something that would support your position, then you run the risk of, of, of coming across as having been biased and not just being a, an independent, but going to look at the property. Um, and, and that's by all means, that's, that's reasonable. Educating yourself about some things in the regulations, all that, that that's fine. It's just, a, there's, a, there's a point in which you're, you're becoming a, kind of an advocate if you're doing other kinds of research. I did have a couple of other questions, but I'll, I'll wait. Somebody else might have one. I do. I have a question on um, delineations that come in with applications. Mm -hmm. um, so we were talking about new lines, and that leads me to think about map amendment. And so I'm wondering, in that case, if we have, um, you know, say there's a slew of approvals that have delineations on them. Do you need a public hearing to amend the map to include them? Yes. Any any amendment, to, it's it's kind of like it's an extension of your regulations. So uh, you 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 would have to uh, have a public hearing to 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 uh, incorporate them. Now, well, let me let me back up on that. If you if you are um, if what's happened is you've already had a determination, right? and I think that's what you were getting at. So maybe I'll back off what I was just saying. If your commission in the ordinary course have made determinations of where the wetlands are, um, I think the people who operate the GP, you know, that, that, that do now so much is done with GIS, but people who update um, it, to reflect what you've already done uh, then no. If somebody comes in and says, I would like you to change the map, and here's my information to change like the a, map, then like you have a petition. to have a public hearing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Then you have to have a public hearing. But if somebody just wants to, to basically codify what you've already decided um, and determined in the ordinary course, I think that can happen without, without a public hearing. It's really like you've already made the decision mm -hmm. um, and staff is just codifying it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. 
I'm a little unclear on what you just said. We had an application uh, in the meadows uh, last year, I believe it was sometime. And there was an issue over where the line for the wetlands ran, whether it ran one place as we had on our map or in another place as the applicant claimed. And the applicant did bring in a soil scientist who you know, staked things out and showed us that in fact, it ran where they said it did. And mm -hmm. so we agree with the application. Yep. Should the map then be changed? You don't. You don't have to. It, it's. It's quite. Quite often over the course of the years. I mean, you, you've got a map. You know, the one that looked like it came from a, a, an aerial view. So you know, you've given a permit. You've determined it. But. Uh, but. And I'm sorry. I don't. Didn't, didn't remember the commissioner's name who just spoke. Uh, but the. You know, if a com community wishes to, a staff wishes to, they could take that line and and if that line is different or more detailed than what's in your wetland map in my view they could update the wetland map to reflect what you've determined um, that's all i'm saying but if somebody came in and actually you don't have to do that because you've made a decision you, you've made a determination of where it is and you've given a permit so so there it is and, I, and they have the permit they can do the activity you don't have to go through the exercise of changing the map but some towns, you know, you, you certainly could, um, you know, engage someone. Most of the times, people have got plenty of busy, you know, busy enough to not do that. But if you wish to, you could come, you could compile the, the the determinations of wetlands that you've done over time and update your map. You would need to do a public hearing. But if sometimes an applicant wants to come in and get the lines squared away before they they want to invest in a project, they want to make sure this is you you're going to agree this is where the line is. And in that case, and they're, they're making a petition to change the map, to identify where the wetlands are, uh, then you'd have to have a public hearing. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I actually had a couple of questions. Um, at least one to start with is, uh, you know, we, the regulations also, I'll talk about floodplain and impacts within the floodplain, which you know tends to be more of a more of an issue than even work in the wetlands as far as the amount of um, applications that come through pertaining to that. So could you speak a little bit to how how this relates to um, regulating the floodplain through the commission? Well, I mean, the, the you could probably do a good or better job of the of the analysis that goes into floodplain regulations, which were really are designed to avoid the, you know, the, the, the floodplain is able to hold water during periods of time, you know, high, high, you know, storm events, high water. And if you're going to fill some of that in, it obviously has an effect somewhere else. The water has to go somewhere else. So there, there are floodplain regulations that um, if you're going to do certain impact, that's going to take up um, and, and, and again, there you do, you do a better job of summarizing what, what, you know what exactly the analysis would be when someone wants to come in and take um, area that's within a floodplain and and basically takes away its ability to hold a certain quantity, certain quantity of water. Um, now that can have an overlap with your regulations because that activity could have it. You do not have the ability to under your regulations to deny something because it's going to have floodplain impacts in and of itself. But often, obviously, that's near water bodies. It's near wetlands. So that activity might include an area that is is a wetland, um, and then you just apply your standards uh, to it. So the, the folks that are going to look at floodplain, town engineer, um, and make determinations about impacts in flood, that really isn't your purview. Uh, but it could overlap if what the work in a floodplain includes a potential impact to a water course or a well. I'm not sure if that answered your question, Derek, but that's no, actually, that, that's just, I think I have another question then. So I have to look back at our regulations, but it was my understanding that, that we have an obligation to ensure that there is no loss in floodplain storage as part of an application that comes through as part of the charge of this commission is are you saying that that only if it somehow ties back to a wetland or a water course does 
does that apply? Um, unless this agency, I, and my 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 presentation was limited to the authority it gets under the Wetlands Act. Now there, it could be charged, and and I'll I'll download and see what I can find that relate to what we're talking, and maybe take another question and come back to it. Um, but the uh, the the as a wetland agency, if it doesn't get separate power, and in its ordinance, it might get separate power to have, just like I said, a planning and zoning commission can also be a wetlands agency and gets authority to do that. But the Wetland Act in and of itself, capacity storage, you know, wetlands serve an important function of being able to, to, to have storage for water. So that is something under the, what, the act that, that's recognized as one of its functions. But it still has to tie to a wetland. It, it, there can be areas of, of, of an upland where you, you've got flood storage. Uh, and if you don't have a tie back to, to its activity, having that, unless the regu you, your agency has also been given some authority with respect to just plain floodplain, regardless of, of impacts on wetlands. So um, that's something that you know, I'll, I'll take a, a quick look while we're, you know, while I feel that there are any questions or if you have another one, I'll jump to it and then uh, and come back. Where's that we given? It's it, the flood, it's a statute, it's statutory, um, but the, so that there's a um, the flood, it's in the, in the general statutes. I'm mumbling here, but, uh, cause I don't know the number of it, but, um, it's 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 statutory, but it, it it but that could be built into the regulations. Derek, I can tell you that in um, East Windsor, they're in the zoning regs. The flood regs are in the zoning regs, embedded in there. So it looks yeah, like they, they yeah. just did it differently here. There's overlap, I think, between our regulations for for inland wetlands and zoning, because I think both of them refer to it mm -hmm. typically the process and uh, you know process has been if it impacts floodplain or impacts a wetland directly then this commission has to act um in recent years we've you know come up with a new po policy that if it only requires an erosion control permit and won't affect wetlands or floodplain then the planning and zoning commission can issue the erosion control permit and it, it used to be they had to come through this commission and then go to planning and zoning so to try and streamline it they stopped requiring applicant to come to this commission. And in that case, they could just go to planning and zoning and get okay. one approval that included erosion control. So that maybe that's something we just need to look at. I mean, generally um, that floodplain issue is resolved at this level with this commission prior to going to planning and zoning. And so often there's a there's an overlap in the re in the regulated resource anyway. I mean, it's it is unusual that you know you've got um, so so you have um, you have a comp compensatory storage. So you've adopted some of the provisions into your wetland regulations that relate to flood storage. Um, and so you've included, whereas normally, um, yeah. So you've, you've built in some provisions in here, um, which ordinarily would be elsewhere uh, into, into these recs, but um, that's, you know, it's not, I don't see that very often, but that if it's been working, that's just fine. Yeah, it, it might come up under a regulated area in the definition of the regs, the first part, because that both speaks to how uh, the town doesn't have an upland review area or a hundred foot buffer, but also it defines a regulate, regulated area for Weathersfield as both the inland wetlands and water courses, as well as areas below the limits of the hundred year flood. From year flood. Yeah. yeah. And then the significant impact, uh, which is a question that we had from one of the commissioners, is defined next. But that definition has words like substantially or adversely. Uh, we had a question if there was any court cases that have more specific guidance as to what is or is not a significant mm -hmm. impact in a wetlands application. Um, I believe that one came from uh, Commissioner Owen. Does, does this, you haven't seen a black screen right now, or are you seeing a section of your regulations? Oh, we're seeing the we regulations. See your okay, yeah. So, so that's so. This is not. I have to tell you, this is not something I zoomed in on on yours because this is this is not common. Um, and and so that you have because there's a statutory definition of what a regulated area is, and so it is unusual to include um, the 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 
floodplain um, as part of what your regulated activity is. So, um, so that's, you know, frankly, Dirk surprised me on that one because I think that's usually handled in, in other ways. But if it's working for you folks and you're familiar with doing it, then have at it. And, and I didn't see, I'll, I'll stop sharing there, but I just was in case not everybody was familiar with that definition, I figured I'd pull it up quick. Yeah, a couple other questions, whether it's what significant impact is, or if it was covered in the slides, we can pull it out there. But that was a that was a question we had for more um, guidance or more specific guidance, uh, mm -hmm. even and even though it is defined as to what may or may not be a significant impact in a wetland application. Well, the, the biggest advice I can give on that, I mean, you've got the guidance and I don't know if you still are you, is my screen still sharing here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, usually there's like a red, uh, some blue or red thing ar around the screen that I'm sharing, and it's not showing that way. So I was concerned it was that. So you know, you start like everything with the regulations, and I know your question was, you know, don't just stick with the regulations. One piece of advice is, is that um, this really is designed not as the as as the tool to decide whether to approve something, but a, more of the tool as to whether or not you need a public hearing. And uh, so the standards um, are up for, they come out of 22841 of all the, the considerations. Not that these aren't, you know, important things to look at, uh, but the, uh, the considerations of uh, under, I'll, I'll, rather than make you all busy, I will stop sharing and, and pull that up. Um, but, you know, these are the ones, you know, activity involving deposition or removal of bacteria, but you have, um, may have, see, this is a critical word here, may have. So if you, some of these things, uh, you know, they could involve deposition of material. It could substantially impact the natural channel or the dynamics of the water course. You know, it could diminish the capacity to support biolo biology. Now then, you know, as I said earlier on, the, the, bio, the, the, the species themselves become wetlands, but only when there's a physical impact. So to the, to the wetlands themselves. So this might create the threshold to saying, we need a public hearing. We need to look at this very carefully. And, uh, you know, there's a chance of substantial turbidity. There's a you know, diminution of flow to a wetlands. You know, these are all something that could cause pollution. I'll go, go up to your definition of pollution, but pollution is very broadly def defined in the act and in your and in your recs. Um, so these are things that you can decide, um, you know, upfront if there's some reason. And, and of course, you know, what's un partially unfair about it is you got to make these decisions before all the evidence is really in. You got to, you know, just the application has come in. But I think it's built to give you the ability, um, or I know it is, to, to, to make that kind of a judgment call um, and, and require uh, the the public hearing if you think any of those things may happen. Can I just ask for a little clarification on the whole discussion on vernal pools? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, the note that I took down is that this, the species relies on the wetland, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you had, say, the spotted salamander in a vernal pool, mm -hmm. not a wetland soil, not sure, you know, if it's just wet during the spring, whether we look at it as a wetland. I was trying to flip through to see if Colonel Pool was defined as a wetland or not. But it sounded like you had to have an impact to the adjacent wetland that served, you know, like there's the nursery in the Vernal Pool, and then an impact was needed in the wetlands. Well, no, a Vernal and Pool would qualify as a water course, an intermittent okay. water course. So That's that, when I was... It, it has one of it has two of those you know two of those criteria because the vernal pool will will uh, will at least will almost always I mean if there's if you get an expert that comes in and says that that yeah a vernal pool is in and of itself is is a regulated resource if you're going to do something that would impact the vernal okay. pool directly then that would be a basis not only to deny because you're affecting the vernal pool but if you also have activities that are that are harming uh, so mm -hmm. let's say you have a modest physical impact to the wetland. To the, to the vernal pool, but it's modest, but it's physical. There's gonna be some physical change. And then that gives mm -hmm. you the ability to look at the salamanders that might be impacted by the driveway that's hundred feet away. 
Um, so that's that was the balance that was struck. So you can actually deny because your driveway is going to prevent the species from getting to the vernal pool. Yeah. As long okay. as the vernal pool has been affected, but the applicant manages to avoid any physical impact to anything, including the vernal pool, then you can't deny because the salamander is going to be impacted for to getting to it. So that's the you know that's the law and sausage of the legislature and making that. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Just got two more questions that we've taken from before, Ken. Yep. Um, if we look at like uh, 9623 and 9624 on the two different ruling types, summary mm -hmm. versus, forgive me if I'm butchering it, plenary or yep. <laughs> for significant you're not. rulings. You, 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 you nailed it. I guess the question is, uh, we're wondering, are we supposed to re review the considerations for decision? Do we have to document in the minutes that we considered each item A through J? Should we have a checklist to discuss this? Or do we need to document our consideration of each of these required items? That's kind of the, the gist of it there. When okay. you look. Mm -hmm. there, there, you know, the, when I mentioned before, there's some schools of thought that you shouldn't say, you should say as little as possible, approve the I and leave it at that. Um, and, you know, but the law says that you really should be making findings, you should be making a determination. So your, your point um, is that if you find a summary ruling that an activity is not a significant one under 9623, um, do you need to then the, go through the, 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 the criteria for basically find the negative? go through the plenary ruling criteria and say, I find that it's not going to A, it's not going to B, it's not going to C, therefore it's, it, it, gets, a, it gets approval uh, as a, under a summary ruling in 9623. And I, I think I misspoke. I think it's 9627. Those are where there's considerations for decisions. Uh, okay. so those, those apply for both, for summary and plenary. But the question is, you know, do we have to... Um, on the record, you know, in the minutes show that we re reviewed that in our discussion that we've considered it. It's a good idea, but no, you, your, your decision is not going to be automatic. They're going to, a court presumes that you, that you know your job and that you've done it and that you've created, and I'm glad you mentioned 9627 because that's, that contrasts with the, the, the characteristics of something being a significant activity. So once you get past the significant activity, those criteria, those are not the criteria you're going to apply. It's going to be the considerations for a decision, which are in 96-27. And those come out of 22-841 of, of, the, of the Wetland Act. Those are the things you can consider. And by all means, when I said before, you, know, you might want you know, to state some of your reasons. One of these might be a particular consideration that there's evidence that shows that, um, you know, that one of the things is there is the feasible and prudent alternative test is built into your into those criteria and you might find that you know that there was a feasible i'm going to deny because there is a feasible and prudent alternative and you can lay it out there but you don't have to every time go through and check off the box this is what i say about a b and c i'm not saying you don't have, you can't you can't but there's no legal requirement that you do that that sounds good was there was there anything else brent or did we cover that adequately yeah, yeah, that's fine. No, that's good. Okay. No, I, we don't need to spend more time on things than necessary, for sure. By all means. Uh, one last thing that we were asked is that uh, a Connecticut Act 2129 said land use commissioners have to get training every two years. Does this qualify as one of those training events, or is that something you know, we got to take care of? It, it should. I actually, believe it or not, I, I, I drafted the criteria that OPM looked at for the environmental portion of the um, uh, of, of the of the training, and this was certainly part of it. So what I don't know, even though I was part of getting those criteria, uh, you know, approved through OPM, is what the process is to qualify it. But I, I can virtually guarantee you the answer is yes. Okay. But I think it's a virtual. How's that for a caveat there? So I, I will talk to the folks at Clear, who we worked with through the University of Connecticut, um, and also the, the gentleman from OPM to just see, you know, what do you need to uh, to document it? Um, do you need something from me or anything like that to certify yeah. that you got the training? But, but I'm actually I, I'm part of the Clear faculty, and, and like I say, worked on the right the, 
at the environmental section. So, so this is all within the parameters of the kind of training that, that is within what OPM adopted. So I would say yes. Thank you. That, that covers all the questions that we've gotten from the commissioners before the meeting. All right. Quickly, Ken, uh, just to piggyback on um, Brent's question about site visit, just for uh, you know educational purposes, just to get familiar with the site, it's okay for two or three commissioners to be there at the same time. Yes, that is that is the way I read the Supreme Court's decision, and there's nothing wrong if you've been doing it differently. You've been citing, you know, calling a special meeting and noticing it and doing it that way. There's a lot of commissions that have built in practice that way and are effective at doing that, I'm not telling you to stop doing that. But based but on just, this Supreme Court- We're just gaining information for our own uh, knowledge. We're not discussing the application. Right. And if you gather something, if there's something you learn there that's unique, you saw something um, and you want to, you know, you just that's the other thing is if you see something um, and you, you ask the applicant about it. I was, you know, I was at the property um, and I, I saw, you know, that what appeared to be, you know, an encroachment on, you know, there, there were there were conservation tags up from, you know, previous application, and it looked like, you know, that you've encroached on that. Can you please explain that to me, rather than wait till the hearing's over and then bring it out? Okay. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Ken, I just want a clarification. I, I believe you had mentioned it, but as far as how the regulations are written, um, the commission, when, when we receive an application, the commission technically should be receiving that application at the first regularly scheduled meeting, which starts the clock of the 65 days to issue a decision. Correct, unless that regular meeting is more than 35 days after it's filed. If for some reason the, there was a meeting that was canceled, so that the first time there's a meeting is 45 days after it was filed, the clock started started 10 days earlier. So usually it's going to be a regular meeting. As long as you're holding your monthly meetings, it'll be that meeting. But if for some reason one was missed, the clock starts 35 days after the date it was stamped into the town hall. Okay. Um, so with respect to that, I guess, you know, one thing I wanted to ask was um, this commission meets monthly. Is that is that typical for Inland Wetlands Commissions versus planning and zoning? That's usually every couple of weeks. Yes, it is typical. I mean, it is unusual for a Wetlands Commission to have so much business that they need to meet twice a month. I would say most all of them are once a month. All right. I just wanted to make sure I understood that because, you know, what tends to happen a lot is applicants come in, you know, they're in a rush. They want to get their approval and they seem to have this uh, expectation that you know when they've submitted an application even if it's a couple weeks before the next meeting that there's going to be a decision at the next meeting and you know from time to time there's situations where staff is trying to get information from them or to get better information to make a better decision and you know commission gets a lot of pressure from an applicant saying you know they can't wait another month to come back they, they need this approval now um, which is unfair to the to the commission and it's unfair to staff that's trying to get information so a lot of times some of these approvals may go through um, with a lot of conditions or um, it seems like it's a rushed decision so i just want to make sure i'm clear the commission's clear that you know you do have the authority to take it in at that meeting you aren't required to make a decision not to say we don't try to be business friendly and you know i think the commission does does work hard to keep things moving and not stall out the process um, i just wanted to be clear that if there there are reservations that no the commission has that authority to and, and it's fully within the regs that it just has to be accepted at that first meeting there, there does not have to be a decision rendered if, if anyone yeah, you don't even need, you don't even need to talk about it um it just it's just the mechanism to measure the time in which you're supposed to take action so you could just you know i have commissions that just you know note you know, this application was received um, and uh, it showed up on our agenda and uh, and it will take it up, you know, take it up next month, especially if something comes in really close in time. I mean, if it comes in early in time and you have the ability to staff gets a review of it, commissioners have a chance to review it. Well, that might be a different story, you know, three months or three weeks or, you know, a month after it's been filed, you, your commission might be in a different position to, to, to do things, but it's still not obligated to, it still can take, take its time. I mean, and, and I, I'm not arguing against being business friendly, uh, but the statutes recognize by giving the you know 35 days for 
just receipt, not decision, but receipt. And then 65 days after the receipt to decide if it's not a significant activity. And if you find it's a significant activity, then as we talked about, you get the you know, 65 to start the hearing, 35 to close it, and then another 65 days to start. So the statutes recognize it's a deliberative process. And, and uh, you know, by all means, if it's easy to make a decision on quickly, you know, have at it. But otherwise, the statutes recognize you have the time to take if you want to. So I have a question. Um, if an application is not deemed significant, don't you have to wait 10 days to see if there's a petition filed? No, you can make your decision. Uh, the, 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 I didn't what think you could, could make a decision on the same night. Yeah, yeah that's that's right. So so you, you should, um, and let me look, I want to pull up your exact language. I want to make sure that uh, you don't, because there, there are some commissions who have acted, and then if a petition has been filed, uh, then, then they hold a public hearing, and that's not, that that's not the right way to handle it. Um, so you are you are right um, in terms of um, when I was just saying that there is an ability to you know if you had enough time and you want to act on it. Uh, but you know, I want to find a specific language. Bear with me here. Um, and it's going to be under your hearing section. And that's actually a good reason to to uh, you know to tell Rush, folks yeah. um, that you know they need to give an opportunity for that to happen because yeah, I'm not seeing uh, I'm not seeing the I know it's in there um, so you, we've got the 65 days I saw it just a few minutes ago too mm -hmm. uh, I'm not pulling, pulling it up but yeah that's a good point you, you should uh, you should allow for the public to be able to request a public hearing uh, before before you take action. So to that point, Ken, I, maybe I'm misremembering, but to, my understanding was that historically the commission has acted and I was under the impression that there was a 10 day window for a petition to be filed before that approval is, a, is official. Are you saying that's not the best way to do it if that is how we've been doing it? Yeah, let me look. I want to make sure that I'm not misspeaking on the way your statute reads. So, so tell me what ha has happened. Have you had an instance in which a decision has been made um, and then a petition is filed after the decision is made to hold a public hearing? That I can remember. Oh, one offhand. Do you remember, Brian? No, I don't. That's what I was just trying to think. So it's, it's 9625. Let's see if it's it might be under 9623 where the agency can issue a permit without a public hearing if no petition for the plenary ruling is filed no later than 14 days after the receipt of that application. The second paragraph in 9623, just dealing with uh, the summary ruling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, but see what that what that would do is if the receipt of the application is the first time there's a receipt, um, you need you, you can't issue you wouldn't be able to issue that preliminary decision until the 14 days go by. That's the that's the example where you know the very first time it's on your agenda. Um, because I don't think there's a different date definition of receipt. I think uh, receipt is not when it comes into the town hall. I think it's receipt by depth by the statutory definition. So I'm going to look at and make sure that's true. So if that's true, um, then it says you can't issue the plenary ruling until that time goes by. So the application has to be received and then 14 days have to go by before you rule, which maybe you're not doing. And, and if you're not and nobody takes an appeal, there's no harm, no foul. Um, it's kind of like the ZBA grants a variance, doesn't meet the standards for granting a variance. If nobody files the, you know, files an appeal, um, then, you know, then, then that's, that's not a problem. So if you've done it, but that regulation is pretty clear that uh, you're supposed to wait until uh, 14 days after the application is received before you make a plenary ruling. And that would be a ruling that you don't need a public hearing. Um, and so that you should wait. Okay, that's, you know, it's just good to know. I think, I think historically that's what we've done. I, I don't know if anyone's ever challenged that uh, to make that an issue. 
Um, but that's that's generally, I think the commission, like I said, has really worked to try and get it done and receiving it and approving it in the same night. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if a petition, if that happened, I mean, you get in the, in the odd scenario um, where you've made a decision and now you have to have a public hearing. So that would be one where, you know, you, you, I would suggest that if you did it that way, um, that, you know, you people make it clear on the record that you're going to base your decision on the evidence of the public hearing and not based on, you know, your, your, you know, your initial ruling that was made without the benefit of a public hearing so that it doesn't appear that the public hearing is a sham. Um, but, you know, the, the you know, moving business that way is something you could do. You know, I would read that that section um, if I were going to take appeal, for example, um, and, and you didn't you didn't give me a hearing because you already ruled on it. Um, I think that would be problematic. Question. If you do have a definition of received, as you only can receive applicant. I'm sorry, I, I, I interrupted you. Uh, I to ask you a question, but you, you do have a definition under your application submission. The application should be formally received only at a regularly scheduled meeting of the agency. And so there is a there is a concept that it's received that night. So uh, that the first meeting after it's been filed. So and yes, sir, sorry. You're basically suggesting that we note that an application has been received at the first meeting after it comes in, but that we don't take any action at that point and wait till the next meeting because of this 14 day rule. Well, what, what I'm saying is that that is really what your, your regulations say um, is that if you're going to issue a summary ruling, um, that an activity is an activity not involving significant uh, uh, impact uh, or major effect on the willing under 9623, it says that you may issue that permit without a public hearing, provided no petition provided for is filed with the agency not later than 14 days after the day of receipt. So that suggests that you shouldn't until the application is received and 14 days go by. Then there's also the practical reality that if, you've been, if you do it and no one files the petition or files an appeal, then the, the right to do that's gonna go away. So. If, Practically, because you want to move business and you approve it, um, you know I would, you know, if you, you ask me to issue, a, you know, legal opinion on what 26, 96, 23 says, I would suggest that you should you should wait and not approve it the same night it gets received because that's the way it reads to me. Uh, but you know, practically, you might do, do differently. And as long as no one files the petition and no one takes an appeal, you're good to go. And if they do, then that just puts you in a funny, a little, not a funny spot, but you have to be careful to make sure that if that public is, is whole, a public hearing is held, that you make it clear that you're going to pay attention to all the evidence presented in the public hearing when you, when you revisit the decision, which you'd be required to do. That's a tough one for us because we in my recollection, we have basically, uh, if there has been no issue with an application when we see it, we've basically approved on a summary basis and let it go rather than holding it up for a month. Mm -hmm. uh, because other things like planning and zoning may be waiting for our action on it too, uh, apart from the applicant. Yeah, no, I, I I I get it, and uh, and, and you know, when such a, and, and look, what's the likelihood on a de minimis, de minimis application like that, where you, you know it's clear from the face of it, there's going to be no impacts on the wetlands. You know, what's the likelihood somebody's going to petition for a public hearing? And that's probably why it's never been an issue for you. Yeah, nobody has. Yep, and so you know, it's it's unlikely. You're you're in the business of protecting the wetlands. If you look at it and you see that there's nothing. You know of any of any uh, any concern, and and conversely, when somebody's doing something that people are concerned about, I, I'm, I'm confident you hear about it. I just have one quick <laughs> administrative question. Um, you know, with this commission, has been is fortunate now. We actually have alternates, which time I've been here, but we haven't. Um, so I just want to understand as far as seating of an alternate, how, how does that work? Um, you know, historically, we haven't even had enough commissioners, but now we do have alternates. So I just want to understand how that works. Normally, what the chair does is try to seat them uh, in a rot rotation basis to try to generally seat them. Uh, so they have, you know, eat, eat. you don't have to you know, keep a calendar of it, but generally speaking, so they, they each have uh, relatively equal 
time as an, an acting number. So it's basically on a rotation, on a rotation basis. If there's, if we have nine members and we have six present and two and two alternates present, do they get seated as members up to the number of nine? If you have a full, if the full regular membership is nine, um, and there's a and so the vacancy is, then yes, they can fill the vacancy. And that's something that's stated at the beginning of the meeting that a certain alternate is going to be seated as a as a full as a full member for this meeting. Right. And then sometimes what, what can happen uh, is you know a member's going to be late and they're seated for a portion you know a portion of the meeting. And usually the practice is you that the, the person who's late will continue to not sit until that agenda item is over. And then they can be seated and then the alternate becomes mm -hmm. an alternate. Uh, but different commissions, you know, have different practices, and there's no specific that there's no specific description in the staff that's how to handle that. Okay. Anyone else have uh, any questions for town attorney while we have them? I'm good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. A lot of information. My pleasure. Tonight. My pleasure. And uh, so have a have a, a great night. And uh, any follow up questions on that through you know through Derek or the chair or, or however, uh, be happy to answer it. And then I, I'll also uh, I'll also confirm that uh, you know if there's any procedural requirements to to demonstrate or confirm that that disqualified as part of your training, um, I'll follow up on that as well. Okay. Very good. Thank All you. Right. Hey, take care, folks. Right. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Bye. Um, commissioners, before you go, I think Brian had one more thing for the agenda, but we lost a couple. <laughs> yeah, already? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and as it was happening, I was thinking to myself, you know, but. I mean, uh, you want to continue the discussion or I mean, how, how do you? Uh, it's I mean, up to you. The it's commissioners up to you, Brian. Are here, how, how, how do we feel about? I mean, town hall is opening, and, and we are planning to resume uh, in person in person meetings. Is is that you know, what's your thoughts? Or, um, I mean, it's. I'm fine with that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Even I'm fine with it. Um, we, we need to get back together. Beautiful. Um, okay. So maybe we can put something together. Uh, and uh, you know, next meeting will be uh, in person. Let the other commissioners know, uh, John. <laughs> Sounds good. We'll do. We'll do, Brian. All right. Do we have a uh, motion for adjournment? I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Very good. Thank you, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.